You know, this is a, a, a neat kind of pairing of, of a particular Pay for Success program called Just in Reach that we talked about last night with the participants who put it together and have launched it and so forth. With today, when we're going to do a little a bit more reflecting on what is Pay for Success or what's called Payment by Results in the UK, and I wanted to make sure to reference not only my colleague here, Kimberly Bailey, who's an author on the book, but also the co-authors from the UK. Kevin Albertson, Chris Fox, and Chris O'Leary from Manchester Met University, and also Jess LaBarba from the Nonprofit Finance Fund, who might be joining us at some point here today if she finds that we're actually on the lower level and not somehow up on the, uh, the actual first floor. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna pair in the talk. I'm, we're gonna start, I'm gonna let my colleague Kimberly Bailey begin talking a lot about the US experience with Pay for Success broadly. I'm going to talk a little bit about the UK experience. You know, certainly my colleagues in the UK can give a better read, but they're not here today. Um, to, to, and then we're going to talk a little bit about reflecting on what, how pay for success fits within the constructs of a lots of different literatures, if you will, like public management literatures, risk management issues, and, and social innovation. Um, this is a tremendous joy for me to have Kimberly Bailey as a co-author. Um, one of the things I enjoy most about being a professor is, is when, especially in this case, the student becomes the master. And in this case, she is the master of, in this field of pay for success. And so, without further ado, I'm really pleased to have you here speaking. And, and it was a pleasure to work with you on this project. Really excited to be back here. I graduated from Price in 2013 and have really enjoyed the opportunity to continue working in employing my degree through the work in Pay for Success. Um, so I'm a senior associate at the Nonprofit Finance Fund and I wanna start by doing a quick introduction to my organization and what we do, because it's really standing on the work that my colleagues have done since 2010 in the advent of Pay for Success that have placed me here today and able to work on this research with Dr. Painter and our other co-authors. So NFF is a 35-year-old community development financial institution which means that we have a vision of the world where capital and expertise come together to create a more just and vibrant society. We do that primarily through unlocking the potential of mission-driven organizations through three lines of business. The first is our lending practice. We have about $100 million in an outstanding loan, and we lend those specifically to social service organizations. The second is our strategic advice practice, which means that we consult specifically with those social service organizations, and importantly, a lot of their funders and financers to look at how we more closely align outcomes with payments. And finally, we lift up all of these great ideas in what we call our accessible insights practice to really understand and further ideas that we think are gonna create that more just and vibrant society. So how does, what is this idea around pay for success and how did NFF further it? In 2010, the Rockefeller Foundation invested in the first social impact bond in the UK, which was Peterborough Prison. And after that, they came to NFF and they asked us, do you think this will work here? And we said, we don't know, but we'll find out. <laughs> and so after a good amount of research, we found that the one thing that we really felt need, needed to happen for pay for success to really achieve, you know, all of the nominal goals that it could have was for there to be someone in a market development role. And so that's the role that we took. So we don't actually, like some of our other CDFIs or partners in the field, structure the transactions. What we do do is we run payforsuccess.org. We've convened and participated in over 100 different events, partnering with organizations like the White House, uh, the James Irvine Foundation, the Department of Labor. We've managed uh, large grant programs and intermediated funds for both the Social Innovation Fund and the James Irvine Foundation. So we've intermediated just over $8 million of funds for the development of about 30 pay for success projects. We've also provided accelerators and educational opportunities to really support all of the stakeholders that are pursuing pay for success. And then finally, we moved a little bit away from our independent role and actually have invested in four of the projects. 
the most recent being the Ventura County Reentry Project. And we did that because we realized that we had a level of expertise as a CDFI to bring to the field. And we also found that to lift up those learnings and to help other financiers in this space, we needed direct experience ourselves. So let's take a quick step back for those of you that didn't have the chance to come with us last night or who may be new to the pay for success field and do a couple quick definitions that we are gonna address throughout this presentation. The first is looking at outcomes-based financing. We think of outcomes-based financing as kind of a bigger tent. This includes things like evidence-based policy, pay for performance and outcomes measurement. And then pay for success is really one tool in the toolbox that helps us achieve that. So pay for success when we define it is normally a contracting approach. So how do we tie payments to measurable outcomes? Which is important because if you think about the way a lot of our social services are currently funded, they're funded based on outputs. So heads and beds in a shelter rather than really trying to solve homelessness. Now, if we wanna look at a social impact bond, which is a little bit of a misnomer because it's not a bond, doesn't operate like a bond, it's really the financing mechanism that enables this contract to, op to work. And we'll go through a little bit of an example and walk through that to make it a little more clear. First, to set in context, where is pay for success happening? Why does it matter? This is from our Pay for Success Learning Hub, which is payforsuccess.org. And we have about 20 projects that are delivering services, and there are well over 50 in development. All across the United States, at city, state, county levels, we're even seeing national development with the Department of Veterans Affairs. We're also seeing a lot of different issue areas. Primarily, pay for, these are the 20 Pay for Success projects that are delivering services, which for those of you who are at Just in Reach, last night means that they've gotten on that other side of launched. And we'll, you'll see that there's kind of a big concentration in the early projects around criminal justice, homelessness, and early childhood. And the reason that there was this concentration in the early days is because these projects were fundamentally structured around the ability for there to be an ROI to the government. So rather than paying for expensive remedial services like jails, or homeless individuals being in and out of the emergency department or expensive um, remedial education in children and families, it's a lot cheaper to do early on preventative programs. Now, what we're seeing in some of the notable trends in market development is that there's increased issue area interest, particularly around healthcare and also workforce. So there are about 24 projects in development around health, and there are about 10 projects in development around workforce. And you all may be saying, hey, weren't a lot of the recidivism projects around workforce? And the answer is yes, you're right. But the workforce projects that we're seeing in development are really about trying to move it to the next level. It's not just about preventing recidivism and placing people in their first job. It's about looking at career advancement. So how do we look at workforce programs that actually have people increase wages, increase responsibilities, and continue on their career rather than just placing them in their first job. So some of the other trends, and I'll walk through these in an example, is looking at the change in project impetus. So like, why are people interested in this? Why does it matter? We already established that a lot of the early ones were about the interest in a return on investment, but that's changing. Um, looking at the project partners, early projects, it was easy to kind of put different people in a box and say, you know, if you're a nonprofit, you're a service provider. If you're a government, you're probably paying. We're seeing that change. Looking at the different financing models, which has laughingly been called a hand-sewn Italian shoe, it kind of still is true, but we're seeing some consistencies and also some real new innovations. And then project size, there's interest in both scale and in smaller projects. And then finally, we'll close with a quick touch on the four projects in the US that have released early results and some of the discussion that's raised around evidence and evaluation and um, the research design. So I find all of this to be really wonky and really nerdy and too much jargon most of the time. So I think it's easier to kind of try and put it in context of a project. And those of you who had the opportunity to see Justin Reach yesterday, have some of those contexts. I'm gonna use a different example. This is Project Welcome Home in Santa Clara County. 
Santa Clara County identified that they had a problem where they had over 2,000 people that were chronically homeless, and they didn't know what to do about it. The current programs weren't working. They were very high touch on jail, police, and other resources for the county. So this project's interesting, and the reason I want to use it as my example for walking through some of the trends in the field is because this project broke a lot of those barriers down and really showed a level of transformation and innovation in the pay for success field. The first of which is, while this is technically a homelessness project, a lot of the metrics that are being tracked and evaluated on this project are around healthcare and around the well-being of the clients involved. The second is that this project was just continued forward with a cost benefit analysis that wasn't that positive. So the county came back, they got the results, and for a six-year term of the cost benefit analysis, there wasn't a high ROI. The county decided they didn't care. They knew that there were going to be, I shouldn't say didn't care, I mean, money's always important. But the county knew that there would be extenuating benefits to the county and to the people involved beyond the term of the project. So it's always important to think about pay for success. It's a financing mechanism in constrained terms. And so really interesting that the county decided to move forward based on their willingness to pay rather than a solid ROI. So, I mentioned earlier that in early projects, it was great to be able to put people in buckets or put different organizations in to select buckets. And I'll walk through kind of how we would look at that a little bit here and also how Santa Clara started breaking the mold through some examples. So the target population is typically who's being treated. Um, in this case, Santa Clara is looking at 150 to 200 homeless individuals and trying to put them into 12 months of permanent supportive housing. That housing is being provided by a social service provider, which in this case is abode services. Um, typically, it's funded up front by investors, which in the first 10 projects, we often saw a need for there to be commercial capital or having banks involved, wanting to have JP Morgan, Northern Trust, or others come in. Santa Clara started breaking the mold here because there's no commercial capital in this deal. This project is, has senior investors that are the Reinvestment Fund and Corporation for Supportive Housing, both of which are CDFIs. The back end payer we've seen is typically government. In this case, it's Santa Clara County. And some of the newer projects, we're seeing an increased interest in it being insurance, philanthropy, or hospital systems. Again, Santa Clara's intermediary was Third Sector Capital Partners. And at the time of this deal, it was normally that Third Sector would sit in the middle of all of it kind of the definition of intermediary. But when they structured this project, similar to Justin Reach that we heard last night, they decided that there are really like three roles that an intermediary takes. And the first is really looking at a transaction coordinator. Who puts the deal together? The second, who manages the funds? And the third, who does that ongoing performance management to make sure that service providers are hitting the metrics? And so in this project, Third sector structured the transaction, but didn't hold those other two roles, really breaking the mold of what people thought was typical for pay for success. And it's a trend that we explore more in the, in the book and that we see more and more often in examples like the Denver project that I'll talk about a little bit later, where we see two CDFIs partnering to split up those roles and responsibilities. Finally, we see the independent evaluator, which is crucial for all of these projects because it's how we trigger what the repayment is. So that's a lot. How does that all actually work together in real life? This is kind of how it works. Um, you'll see a couple different graphics. I'll highlight this is specific to Santa Clara because normally what you'll see is you'll see all of these lines kind of coming in and flowing through the transaction coordinator. It's not what's going on in Santa Clara. And I think some of the other interesting differences in Santa Clara that we've seen kind of moving into some of those additional innovations um, in investment is that they went beyond this project to structure a second one. And the second one is working in acute mental health. And there, Santa Clara decided, we don't want outside investment at all. And so they're in a risk sharing agreement with Telecare um, for their partners in wellness project, which is 
the second pay for success project that they've done here in Santa Clara. Now, I do want to take a minute to pause as we get into some of the innovations and trends in financing to remember that a lot of what we're talking about is just this piece down here. We're talking a lot about the capital stack and the money that's raised, but it's really just a very small portion of leveraging a lot more resources for a community that really needs them. So in Santa Clara, they raised $6.9 million, and they have the opportunity for up to $8 million of repayment terms. But there is $17 million of other resources that are going into the delivery of this project that we shouldn't forget about. So going back to that little piece, the capital raise and how it comes together, these are the 20 projects that have come together and are delivering services across the United States. I guess they say you always have to have at least one slide that's hard to read. This one's mine. <laughs> So you can find a lot of this information on payforsuccess.org. But what's really interesting when you start thinking about innovations in the capital stack and the capital raise is you look at the different variations and roles of senior investment, which is the blue, subordinate investment, which is the red. Those of you who had the chance to, to come to Justin Reach yesterday got to hear a little bit more about the really important work that Hilton did coming in as a subordinate position and bringing in and making it accessible for United Health to come in as a senior in position of $7 million. So some of the other innovations in financing we're seeing is that change in scale, how much is being raised. We're also seeing a difference in the way they tranche the, the capital that's raised. So I'm gonna go a little bit into Denver because it's really interesting as an example. They decided to tranche all of the uh, capital and all of the outcomes payments based on the outcomes. So they're measuring both homelessness and recidivism outcomes, and they've broken that out separately. So investors are paid based on which group they're in. The other thing that's interesting about Denver is that they look to do earlier payments to sh shorten down the duration and thereby reduce the risk in a lot of these projects for investors. So even though Denver was just launched in 2016, they actually already repaid their investors this year. And we'll see that on the next slide. The other thing that's interesting is just a change in how people are thinking of payment triggers. A lot of the earlier projects, so the first 10 here, have a threshold payment, which means that people want to know, are you reducing recidivism by 10%? And what you see in a lot of later projects is people are moving closer to something that's called a rate card approach, which is setting a price, basically, for any kind of successful outcome. And Denver did that. So we see that in Denver, they were looking at $15.12 per day of stable housing per individual, which meant that they could track that and pay back investors by an early measure. And they paid back about $188,000, um, I think it was just last month. And so we're seeing a lot of innovations in the structure. I think one of the other projects, I don't think I know, one of the other projects that um, has shown early results is the Sh Chicago Child Parent Center Pay for Success Initiative, where more than half of the children who participated were deemed kindergarten ready. This project kind of flew under the radar a little bit um, because there was a lot of debate about the, pro the two projects that showed results before it, which are the Utah High Quality Preschool Program and the NYC Project for Incarcerated Youth. The Utah High Quality Preschool Program came under a lot of scrutiny about the evaluation design. People really felt that it had been too easy for them to achieve success and too easy for Goldman to get their money back. So they did a quasi-experimental design. This is not a randomized control trial. And only one out of the 110 students was deemed ne needing to have um, special education services, which meant that Goldman got all of their money back. And then the New York City ABLE project also created quite a stir because this was the very first pay for success project in the United States. And it was implemented on Rikers Island with an intervention that's called moral recognition therapy. It has a very strong, very solid evidence base, but Rikers Island it's a really interesting culture, really interesting environment. And so it had a lot of issues in implementation and also in project design. 
So after delivering services for four years, the evaluator came back and said, there's no impact. It's not making a difference. And so the project was stopped. And what that meant, this project had a guarantee, talking about different types of financing, but it meant that there was a little over $9 million that was lost. The, um, the guarantee covered 75% of it, but Goldman lost a little over a million dollars. This project's interesting because while the intervention was a failure, I'm gonna use that in quotes, because it's not saying that they didn't have impact on anyone. It's saying that they didn't have the impact that was necessary to get paid. Um, a lot of people touted this as a success of the use of pay for success and why we're here and why we're doing this, which is giving government the ability to innovate and to try something new without having to take the risk, without taxpayers having to take on the risk of a large and new program. Yes. Okay, when they lost a million dollars, uh, are these nonprofits and aren't they able to be written off? It's, it's Goldman dollars. that lost the million dollars. The Goldman. Okay. Is it a nonprofit that they help be written off? To date, that hasn't been an established policy. It's something that they've worked on in the UK a little bit, but um, being able, I mean, they can write it as a loss, but they can't write it off as like a donation. All right, well, why don't I kind of grab the baton a little bit and reflect a little bit on the UK experience. But one other thing I forgot to do in introduction, and this is part of the fun of being in the academy and also being at the Price Center for Social Innovation, is that we had a conference which was about two years ago, somewhere around there. It was called Activating Markets for Social Change. And we had a panel. And that panel was on pay for success, social impact bonds. And two of the panelists were Chris Fox from the UK and Jess LaBarba, who just walked in, um, from the Nonprofit Finance Fund. And conversations started to emerge in that panel, and there was kind of just noticing that the UK and the US had followed some different pathways and different approaches, and there could be something really interesting there. So Chris reached out to me and said, hey, would you be interested in writing a book on, on such things? Um, and for me, my natural reaction was like, yes, if, Jess would be interested in participating because of the work of NFF has already laid the groundwork and all I would be doing in cataloging the US experience would be basically quoting from their work extensively. And so super happy that you agreed and then brought your colleague from NFF and then for me it was great to work with Kim again as in this new role uh, on this project. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about UK and just kind of how they evolved, et cetera. Um, which is a little bit different, and it really gets to this question of how we might understand the broader context, as Kim introduced, in terms of outcomes-based financing and the wide variety of structures, and how that fits into the kinds of things that we've been doing in government for a long time to fund social services. So in the UK, first thing is they call it payment by results, not pay for success. Um, it kind of began in the healthcare sector as a way for government to reimburse only when certain targets were achieved. So it kind of came from large in, in the health systems that if you were reducing kind of time in hospital, then you would get a, a payment. So if you kind of think about it, it was like a little bit of incentive-based contracting, if you will. And it certainly wasn't the program. Right, so it was kind of like, okay, we're funding this public hospital, but we'd actually fund the hospital a little more if you do a little better, right? And so that was kind of, as it started to emerge there, it wasn't the kind of standalone program that at least the US experience typically started with, like the, the program in Rikers Island or the Utah program, et cetera. But instead, it was part of an existing flow of, of, of public resources to a particular service area in which case, especially, um, you know, they talked a lot about kind of the political environment that emerged and wanting to have more payment by results and these kinds of things. And so they started embedding little elements of contracts that were incentive-based contracts. And so when you think about like what is payment by results in the UK, and you'll start kind of just saying, I want to see the example of what does a program look like. It, it really varies incredibly uh, I mean, when you think about the kinds of programs that are of scale of the U.S., which are kind of in the 10 million range, that kind of thing, 10 million pounds in their case, but there's also s programs that are called payment by results that are several billion pounds. So this is like, you might think, well, no, that's not even at all what we're talking about here, because this is, if you came at it from the U.S. experience, 
which is where I was more embedded um, and certainly didn't know as much as my colleagues here. But I had seen them and kind of had the program and was really excited about that, the evolution of it as a social innovation. When, I, when we were talking to my colleagues in the UK, I was like, that's an entirely different conception of what's going on. Right? They're starting with like, how does government even just deliver services and let's incentivize it a little bit, et cetera. And so when you think about like how they've done that, so in some cases they had this, this program called the work program contract where the actually a very large proportion of the payment was tied to performance. And then there was a program called the Trouble Families contract where a very small percentage of payment was tied to actual results. And the book has many more details on that. And I don't want to spend too much time on that because I want to open it up to Q&A and also to kind of reflection on what we might make of these trends that we are seeing in this, uh, in this space. And so, as Kim mentioned earlier, there was the first social impact bond um, program, which was this Peterborough program. It got huge attention because it was the first that was structured in the way that many of the US structures that she was talking about was put out. But prior to this, in 2004, really the first payment by result contract in, in the UK system. There was a reduction in recidivism of 9.36%. The financing came from 13 charitable trusts. However, because of the way the contract was set up, it did not trigger repayment. So the way that these are set up, as has hopefully become apparent now, is that you kind of get together with a contract and there's lots of different contracts, as Kim alluded to now, where sometimes you can get partial payments, you can get payments in a year, you can get payments only at the end. If you really far achieve the results, you could get twice your money back, right? In some cases, you only get your interest back plus the payment. That was the case with Justin Reach that was just talked about last night. Um, in this case, it didn't get to the target, and I forget actually if it was 10% or what it was, but it didn't get there, so there was no repayment, right? In the case, of Rikers Island, what you saw was that you know, Goldman had gotten an insurance contract, so just in case it didn't make the target, it covered part of there, so it was kind of like that's how they did some risk sharing. Um, and you'll see that embedded in a lot of these, but you're seeing it now with risk sharing in all different levels, and we'll get back to that point because that's really what's, what I find to be especially interesting about this mechanism, if you will. One of the, uh, the there was a, they had kind of a, I forget what it was, a social impact bond kind of, or social impact, or social innovation fund, if you will, in the UK. They decided to fund 10 social impact bonds. One of them was the Nottingham Futures Social Impact Bond in 2003, uh, 2012, and it was there to increase young adult employment. Um, this was the Department of Works and Pensions Innovation Fund that funded it, and it did trigger a payment of 2.5 million back to the Department of Work and Pensions. So in this case, it was a government department that was the investor, um, and they got a return of, of eight million pounds from the project working out. So it's like from one government agency to another government agency. So there was a return on the investment. And that's where the idea or the terminology of social impact bond kind of arose was like if you invest in a bond, then you get money back on the bond and it's kind of like interest on return. The thing about pay for success or the social impact bond, if you know a little bit about finance, is that bonds typically have you know middle level returns, there's middle level risk and so forth. These had what I would call as someone who actually did study finance in grad school, has an equity risk. So it's actually very risky in the sense of the projects range of possible outcomes. That's how I'm talking about risk here. It could be hugely successful, it could be very marginally successful, or it could actually not improve outcomes at all. But that range is pretty wide. In a bond, usually if you're a private investor and you invest in a bond, you want something that's pretty steady. But if you're investing in something that isn't steady and has equity risk, like a wide range of outcomes, then you want to be compensated much higher. So Jeff Liebman, who's a professor at Harvard who ran what was called the social impact Social Impact Bond Lab for a while, he, that was his kind of phrase that he always used. It's like a bond return with equity risk. Who wants to get involved, you know? So impact investors and so forth were one way that kind of bridged that gap. So one of the things that I found was really interesting in the conversation when I first started talking to Chris about the project was that in the UK, they had focused mostly on recidivism and young adult employment, reducing homelessness, and then some vague kind of programs around improving outcomes for children. I say vague in the sense that those were not necessarily social impact bonds, but kind of these broader programs that had pieces of incentive contracts. When they heard that the third most popular case in the US 
was on early childhood, they were dumbfounded. Because one of the principles here is that you can clearly identify a revenue stream by which the government can pay off the investor. And if you're thinking about the outcome for your, for your children, while you could imagine remedial services, which is typically what it was tied to here, is the outcome that you're reducing the cost of, what you really care about with early childhood is how it affects their life trajectories. So they were just like, well, what are you doing with like early childhood? Because the outcome with respect to reducing homelessness or reducing visits to the ER and so forth, that's immediate. And so it was easier to write a contract to tie to savings from the government to the, you know, to the investors and then of course, you know, what the services are being provided. So that was kind of those interesting things that emerged in different ways. And so that was the point I made on this point is just thinking about what the outcome is because that's really the, one of these kind of exciting things about this, this evolution is to focus on outcomes, but then if the outcome is not really an outcome, but it's an output of some kind, then we haven't maybe pushed it as far. And that's where the early childhood case in the, U the US was kind of odd for my UK colleagues. So is pay for success the right fit? You know, I know whenever people first hear about it, you're thinking, this sounds amazing for the government, right? Because you can try new things. So as long as you can convince philanthropy or some impact investor and maybe even private capital like Goldman Sachs to pay, you get to try it out and the government only pays if it works, right? And so given our constrained resources, it seems like this could be this really a tool that, that really opens up the ability to try all sorts of new things. It's not really a silver bullet. You know, we could have a different color to it, et cetera. If you were here last night, you saw how much Corinne Buchanan and Andrea Luian were really happy that they had gotten to the launch, and that's because it took a lot of time and money to get to the launch. The contracting, and you saw the, you know, the, the you know, Kim's kind of graphic of investors here and there and all of that. I mean, it really takes a long time to put together, and then you have to have strong agreement on the evaluation metrics, the outcomes, and all of those kinds of things, and so, kind of implied in some of her remarks, Santa Clara, when they were kind of about to launch a second pay for success, says, oh, let's just not go through all that. Let's just kind of focus on outcomes in our current program and we're gonna kind of do it differently than we did before, but we're not gonna go into the whole big contracting and stuff. It's just not worth all the trouble. And as I hope you're kind of noticing, it needs to somehow be t tied to a particular government savings that would accrue if the program is successful in order for it to work as a contracting mechanism, right? So if you reduce time in the ER, that saves someone money, they are then willing to pay out of those savings. And it doesn't work so well if you can't identify often a singular government agency or department. If you have to identify the savings come from two or three, then that gets really complicated just from a transaction standpoint to get everybody on board. Well, you'll pitch in this amount of money and then you pitch on this. So it almost works not necessarily best, but you know, it's, 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 more, it's easier to launch if you can kind of narrow it down to one department in one place to kind of launch, and then they can repay if it works. So we could talk a lot about whether it's a silver bullet or not. Um, it's certainly exciting to think about, but you might come to the conclusion right away that this is the wrong type of contracting mechanism to spur social innovation in a particular sector. It just doesn't make sense because it, it serves certain pieces but not others. So this was Kim's slide and it got the arrow. So you have the right arrow for the right you know, challenge and problem. So here's some just some of the opportunities. And so we started to reflect on what have we learned in U the UK? What have we learned in the US? And what can we have learned from each other's experiences in this? And so you have seen things like the opportunity to scale a promising outcome. So Justin Reach is a perfect example. It was really a small scale program they tried. They're like, we're seeing some evidence base here. The pay for success model enabled them to now test it on 300 of the hardest to serve people coming out of prison who have substance abuse problems, mental health issues, et cetera. Right? So they were able to scale this because of this program. It provides service providers with multi-year contracts, a commitment from investors to say, we're doing this for three years, we're doing this for five years. So service providers can come in and deliver those services knowing the contract's gonna be there for, through the duration of of the time of the program. You can, it's certainly you know, transparent, it's efficient in some sense, and again efficient, we're gonna put in quotation marks because we have to think about that, but at least 
we understand where the money's being used and how risk is being shared and those kinds of things. Again, we'll return to that idea a little bit later. You can clearly see that evaluation is critical to these contracts. But what, we're, what we saw in the US context is that there's been much more of a, of a requirement to use the most strict quantitative methodology, so a randomized controlled trials to assess outcomes, or very strong quasi-experimental methods to assess outcomes. And in these cases where, you know, like in the Utah case, it wasn't necessarily about the method, but more about the, frame, the, the line of like how, how, how uh, difficult it was to achieve the objective. Um, but in the UK, it turns out they haven't had as a, a rigorous of methods of demanding randomized control trials and, and really strong quasi-experimental methods on the larger programs. And that's partially embedded because of some of the politics. If you have a $10 billion program, you probably just can't practically like do a randomized control trial of everyone who's in this program and, and those kinds of things. And so they actually, on the methodology side, haven't been as strong in evaluating some of the work that's there, but they've also had a broader scope, and so that's part of the issues there. So there are some challenges in putting together these contracts, um, in particular pay for success, but also just broadly outcome-based fun funding. So I think it hopefully becomes apparent is that actually there's true costs that aren't immediately apparent. And last night, you know, when, when Hilton just spends a million dollars just to say, talk about this for two years, that's a million dollars, right? Knowing that it's gonna take that long to get there. And so that's something you have to understand is what kind of capacity. And so there've been groups like NFF and third sector capital, social finance, intermediaries that have kind of acquired some capacity to be able to provide that support to, to, to uh, you know, government. The Social Impact Bond Lab got a bunch of money from Rockefeller and the Social Innovation Fund to actually pay for you know, graduating master's students to go get embedded in a city or county agency to basically on every day help them through putting together a contract. Right, so, it was, it, so there's a big capacity issue about putting together this contract because while Wall Street, you know, has, a, there's a lot of money at stake, a lot of investment and so forth, and they were, if you saw the big short, anyone see the big short, right? So you, I can talk about tranches and CDOs and all that because you saw that movie. If you haven't, then it's still kind of weird language. But you can see that some parallels here, right? There's parallels with like stacking capital and tranches and risk this tranche faces this risk and this faces this risk. It probably would have been better to show the clip from the movie because that was one of the things that was amazing about the movie is that you know, they explained it in a way that people walked away and said, I know what a CDO is now, a collateralized debt obligation. I, I can talk about that. Um, and so you can see some of these other complexity of just the program, the transactions and so forth that's there. You see that you know, as, that local context matters. So you can have it evidence-based somewhere, but when you apply it to Rikers Island, right, that's part of what, it can change things. You have different capacities of stakeholders. In Utah, you had, you know, an ambitious local government that wanted to try this in all sorts of areas. And so they garnered the capacity and started launching, and, and so they learned from these things, right? Um, you have, uh, like, the timing itself, like, Again, this catalytic support around kind of the, the constellation of the ecosystem is really, really important. You have to engage stakeholders from the very beginning, you know, from that whole loop of from investors all the way to the providers, to the government agencies, et cetera. There's likely to need some technical expertise. You need to know what the evaluators are going to do. And this is something that, you know, as an academic, we teach our students and so forth about evaluation is that if you as an evaluator didn't design the evaluation, you're probably gonna, it's gonna be really hard to evaluate it. So you wanna be on both sides, right? You wanna design what it should look like so that you can evaluate it effectively. So lots of stuff going on there, and of course there's just, there's no uniformity. So while there have been 20 programs launched in the US and there's another 30 in development, you can't just say this is the, the model, and it's not plug and play, right? So there's all sorts of interesting, Cases, I talked already a little bit about the evaluation techniques. There's a little bit more uniformity in the US about evaluation designs, um, but there's huge variations in investment structure. And the slide you couldn't read is one of my favorite slides in the book because again, I said I, I had this finance background that I've really never pursued academically a ton, but 
just the fact that you had to ha stack all these different capital pieces is really interesting. Um, and again, feeds to the complexity. So you think about the types of interventions. I think we already talked about this a little bit in terms of what works well with pay for success. Um, and so maybe to save time, I'll jump ahead. We've talked a little bit about, I mean, not, we haven't talked a lot, a lot about you know, kind of service providers themselves, but you know, one of the things, the advantage of pay for success with respect to service providers is that they get the contract to go and do things. However, if you're going to evaluate what's happening, a lot of times you have to provide additional systems, IT data, financial systems, for service providers who haven't been collecting those kinds of data in a regular fashion that they may not have had before. And so they have to be brought in early on to make sure that they're willing to provide the services so that they can actually provide the data necessary that it can be evaluated as you go forward. And then, you know, I think leadership, we could have had a whole talk on just leadership uh, if we really wanted to, because you need a champion, straight and simple, with this kind of a, of a project. And so we'll stay there. So I think uh, this was kind of our bottom line in thinking about the book. Like, if you're going to do this, you just need to understand the true cost. You need to develop these partnerships ahead of time. You have to figure out the data sharing agreements, what kind of data infrastructure you need. And then you can build an evidence base for these certain kinds of programs and interventions where this kind of a structure can work well. Um, it can be worth it, right? So even though they seemed exhausted last night about how getting to the finish line of launching, what it can do is something that maybe other interventions, social innovations, if you will, couldn't do. And so you might be able to shift to using data to help frontline service delivery in a way that's going to help build a better ecosystem for other projects, right? So it's an ancillary benefit. You can't claim full credit for this, but you know it's one of those things that you're building capacity more broadly. Um, it's changed how people thought about what you know some people call the triple P, the P3, the public-private partnerships, all those kinds of things. But to think about them differently than just kind of transactional to embedded in the common objective or outcome that you're trying to achieve. And so that's kind of changed, but again, that's part of an overall evolution of people recognizing the need to change from the traditional public-private partnership model, which was transactional, to much more of a model of collaboration where you are also thinking very carefully about the community that you're serving in this contract, it's, you know, even us calling it the target population is very clinical and sterile. And you know, I sometimes in the, an academic setting, I can get away with that, but I don't want I want to actually pause for a moment because you know, that's not like a target population because these are people who have oftentimes different kinds of things have happened to them in their lives and that this program is designed to help change trajectories and life trajectories. So just kind of pausing on that for just a second. Other things, the, the scaling piece, you know, you just can't find the capital, the resources within a government agency to do it, right? We've already seen this project because you only pay for success. Maybe we'll try to scale something that might be working at a really small level. And then these kind of, we, we talked about kind of the benefits of stronger, stable relationships with service providers. So where I, to me, kind of from a Center for Social Innovation perspective, thinking about, well, how does this fit as a social innovation? Like, how can we reflect on what is the innovation, right? There's all sorts of stuff going on. Is it the capital stack? Is it this? Is it that? Like, what is it? And so for, for us in the book, as we kind of like kind of thought about it, we thought about it in three categories, right? So it, there's a bunch of streams of things happening, right? And sometimes innovation is not coming up with something exactly completely new. Right, so even the iPhone, right, which put together the iPod and then a phone and then a computer and then kind of threw them all together, right? So you couldn't say that it, it invented something, but it did invent something new, but it was coming out of these different streams, right? And so innovation itself is often the combining of new things in different ways. So one of the, the areas is in kind of what I would call new public management. Now, unfortunately, my faculty colleagues in new public management aren't here today because we're interviewing for new chair in the governance department at, at Price School, and they're all there. <laughs> Except for me, so I'll have to watch the video later, and I'll meet with the candidate later today. But, um, so 
I was, uh, I'm looking forward to talking to them more about the public management piece, the risk management piece. Hopefully you've gotten a flavor for a little bit. And then there's a new way for kind of philanthropy and government to work together to achieve social outcomes. And this is kind of in kind of this thinking of it as a specific kind of social innovation. So what I mean by the extension of new public management, if you will, is to think about the stream of how government would measure to outcomes rather than outputs or inputs. So from in the US context, the 1996, 98 reform, I'm blanking on which year, but Al Gore kind of as vice president spearheaded how he was going to transform government agencies to become much more performance oriented, right? And so what does performance mean? Well, then you actually agencies, federal agencies were asked to say, what outcomes are you trying to achieve? So you can't say that pay for success caused government agencies to care for outcomes, right? It's not like all of a sudden pay for success happened in 2010, it started, boom, now governments care about outcomes, right? But it, maybe it accelerated a little bit. And, when, and if you wanna go back to uh, Jeff Liebman, who I referred to earlier, that you can go back to our website. We had him out, and that was the title of his presentation, is does social, new social impact bonds accelerate? this kind of stream. So that might be what it is, is that what we've really done is seen something that started back in the mid 90s from the government side. Now we can understand this outcomes based financing is helping to accelerate our movement toward outcomes in that context. So it didn't invent it, but maybe it accelerated it. Dunleavy et al kind of highlights the importance of incentives and competition. So there are really interesting elements of incentives that we've already talked about. But there's also in some sense, competition, because who is going to deliver the program in a lot of these projects, we didn't have time to talk about it, but it's talked about a little bit in the book, is, is actually through a competitive process of who's the service provider has the best idea sometimes. Now, not all of them were this way. In some cases, you've already identified what you want to do, like just in reach, is we want to scale this program working with these people, right? But in other cases, it's completely open to like figuring out who has the best idea and let's going to bring them in. And then the evaluator piece is also through some competition and selection to make sure we have the best evaluator and those kinds of things. So that again is not new, but it certainly is, is critical in the pay for success model. The piece that I find incredibly interesting about pay for success is this issue of risk management. And my UK authors also like to call this like complexity. So risk management and complexity. Because when you think about the analogy between the CDOs and tranches and all that kind of stuff that I talked about before in the private sector and how you can split up risk and so forth, what they're really talking about in splitting up risk is something is the project risk. And also sometimes in the private sector, we talk about the portfolio risk. So like a whole set of projects you might be doing. So it's not just a single project, but it could be portfolio projects. You can see that analogy work somewhat well in the public sector, what we're talking about here, because you can say this is a just and reach program. It's intended to reduce recidivism and reduce the demand on mental health services for a particular population. And its individual riskiness, if you will, is that this program might work by reducing recidivism by 10%, 20%, or it might only reduce it by 5%, right? So there's a riskiness, if you will, in the project. We don't know a priori if it's going to actually deliver what we hope it delivers, right? And so what this kind of arrangement does in thinking about transferring risk is that the, politi you know, the, the, the government is able to transfer risk to these investors. The investors are willing to take it on for two reasons. One is they might get a return if it pays off. Again, I said before, it's really a bond return, not a kind of equity return, but in that set, it's still a return. And then there's also impact investors that want to just facilitate new ideas. And so that return is a social return. Right? But that transference from the government agency outside is a way of kind of sharing risk in a way that maybe wasn't available before. So that's a really important innovation. The other piece of risk in the public sector and in social sector work that isn't the case in the private sector context is first and foremost political risk. Right? So you can imagine this working out in all sorts of different ways.
But if you're you know, a head of a department or you are part of the Board of Supervisors, it might be much easier for you to say, let's try this new idea if I don't actually have to pay unless it works. Right? And so my job in some sense, whether I'm going to get reelected or not, or get reappointed as manager or director, is not nearly as at risk as if you'd said, I'm going to allocate $10 million to try this new program directly. Right? And so again, this sharing, if you will, given the political risk and the political environment, and I can't quite give you the analogy to the CDOs and the tranches in the big short movie for the political risk here and how it fits in. I'm working on it, I'm thinking about it. Maybe that's the next book. Um, and actually, if I do write the next book, it will be in the next book because I think this notion of how this interacts, the political risk with the project risk, hasn't been really thought of in the way we need to think about it yet. Um, but that's an important element. And then you also have the kind of organizational risk. Could be institutional risk. I, I, I argue that in the social sector work, there is almost perhaps increased organizational risk than the private sector, even though the organizational risk there is if you fail, you go out of business, you're done. So yes, the organization ends, but it's kind of embedded in the project in a sense. So it's kind of like one and the same. And we could argue about that if you want um, any time. But it's because it's I don't know the answer, to, be, to tell you the truth. So it's not an argument as someone's going to win, or, or if you have more information, you're, you're likely to win. But this piece is also an interesting kind of slice, if you will, of understanding this. And so once again, these, triple, these three kinds of risks are shared in ways that we haven't been able to share before. See, the service providers, it reduces their organizational risk, right? They get a contract for three years, right? Whereas before, they could be in and out in no time. This is giving them some stability. And yes, you could have given a five-year contract before, but you may not have wanted to do so because of political risk and so forth. So we argue in the book that this is an important innovation is, is it provided lots of different ways to share the risk that weren't available before. And for me, that's probably the most telling part of, of how to think about it, but that's just one co-author. All the other co-authors might have different views on this. Um, and then the third category is this new way for philanthropy and government to work together to deliver social outcomes. So thinking about, you know, if I'm a philanthropist and I'm the kind of philanthropist that likes to give grants, um, so I would have been fine doing social goods, that's uh, just what I do. But if I'm a philanthropist, you know, I've come out of Silicon Valley, I'm getting you know, all these great ideas, I want to be an impact investor, but I want a return. And I think if I do that, I can get a social return on my investment and so forth. Well, you might look for these kinds of tools, whereas a traditional grant maker may not worry about this kind of tool. I don't need all this crazy fancy stuff, you know, but you, know, you can see how a whole other class of philanthropy might be very intrigued by these kinds of tools, right? And so that provides that opportunity, and then certainly the SIBs in particular are going to appeal to certain types of impact investors that just simply wouldn't have participated. So what's really been interesting in kind of the final reflection, if you will, is just kind of where we're at, is that you're seeing kind of this movement toward, in this work, outcomes instead of just outputs, prevention instead of just treatment after the fact, and this notion of pain for what works. And there's a whole what works movement, which is kind of exciting. And so where are we today? Well, Kimberly ha hinted a little bit at the Santa Clara case where it almost looks like the Santa Clara County is moving a little bit toward where the UK was in, it, in, in terms of embedding kind of a pay for success ethos in a broader government program without having to have an outside investor, without having to have like outside service providers in the same way, et cetera. Um, and so the UK, while it started broadly, it developed these SIBs in 2010 as like an offshoot. For we, we kind of started with what were SIBs there and then kind of becoming more broad. Um, but this notion of developing metrics and employing these appropriate valuation methodologies does remain a, a clear challenge and that's part of this contracting arrangement, right? If you're going to do this, everyone has to agree on the metrics. And you can quite easily think about the incentives, right? Because if you want to get repaid, then you'll want the metric as low as possible. And if you want to make sure, as the government side, that you don't have to repay unless it really, really, really works, then you want it at a certain level. 
At the same time, I think what's really been interesting in the most recent ones is that you have all this interim repayment, right? You're starting to get these interim marks. So again, thinking about it as a risk sharing tool, you can see that people didn't want the all or nothing at the end, that there was still too much embedded risk in that. And so you wanted to kind of have these markers along the way, you get paid along the way, you have kind of like, this isn't working, let's get out kind of exit strategies, all sorts of interesting things there. And of course, if you do that, then you're maybe hurting the kind of like stability for service providers <laughs> if you can exit after six months, but, but those are some of the trade-offs that are there. Are those interim payments you're talking about calculated based on what the government has saved per person usually, or how are they determined? Well, you gave one example where it was kind of price per thing, but I think, Kimberly, you're probably better suited to answer in a broader sense. So I think this kind of goes back to each project being unique. And so inter interim payments can depend on a lot of variables, right? So what's the type of issue area you're involved in? What's the intervention? But typically, interim payments are designed to do two things, as Dr. Painter po pointed out. It's to give an earlier payment point, which is about kind of that risk sharing and reducing risk. And also, they're normally identified as something that is an early indicator. So a lot of the times, they're really more of an output than an outcome. So it's not really looking at what you asked about, like that long-term saving around outcomes. But it's an, it's an early indicator that somebody's on the right track. So kind of looking at that, um, some of the interim payments, like what we saw in Chicago, was kind of that pre-K readiness Inter interim payments. We see interim payments by like early metrics of days and stability, things like that. Thanks, Siri. So the point that you ended on about thinking about how these sort of metrics get set is what I kept trying to puzzle over. And being someone who's sort of new to this field, are there sort of common practices of like, or are there differences across countries in terms of sort of who's involved or who has more power in these negotiations, either? the government or the investor, or I was wondering, are there some uh, situations where sort of whoever's going to do the external evaluation can also kind of weigh in? And I just, I, I would like to be, reflect a little bit more on this last point. Well, I'll say something first, and I think I'll turn it over to my colleague, because when I, when you, it first has to start from some kind of evidence base somewhere, right? So it could have been a really small pilot program, or it could be some comparable program and so forth. And so when people are starting to come to the table, they look at, well, we have some promising practice happen in this context, in this context, or maybe it was small, maybe it was the wrong place, as kind of a point of, of negotiation to begin with. But from there, you, you might have some war stories of helping people in different places, like how did, who, who won where and, and moving forward. I think we've seen a lot of these projects come together differently. And I think one of the biggest concerns that I mentioned you know, early on for NFF is we really wanted to make sure that everybody could come to the table to negotiate in a new way. And I don't think, and feel free to correct me if you feel differently, Jess, I don't think any two projects have felt the same about coming to that table and who has that, that social capital, that voice. I think that one of the things that we really encourage and try and help people who are interested in these different, uh, from all of the stakeholders, is to come to the table as strong as possible. Um, but you're right. Like it's, it's very different. It's a new way of engaging. Service providers aren't used to coming to the table and having to have that discussion of, you know, this is my intervention. This is truly my full cost. We see so often that service providers have spent so much time kind of trying to shoehorn their programs into what the grant agreement is that it takes a whole other level of like analysis and understanding to come to the table and say, this is truly the full cost of what it takes to really deliver this project. And you heard a little bit yesterday from Corinne about being kind of a full cost funder and how she talked about the Justin Reach project and how they really had to reevaluate that if they want to have service providers that are do whatever it takes, we also need funders to be kind of do whatever it takes. And so it's, it's important to think about that, but I think one of the things that we really encourage people to think about when they come to the table is make sure that you're still setting like, what are those big goals that we can all agree on? And when you come to the conversation that way, I think it's helpful because it's not about cutting corners, it's not trying to you know, inappropriately find cost savings, because if that happens, we don't achieve the outcomes we're trying to get to. So my, my colleagues from the UK, they did quite the kind of digging expedition to try to figure out how all of those things were happening, especially in these programs where the payment by result piece was very small. And they actually have written a whole separate paper outside the book context just on some of those issues like you were talking about. In so many cases, though, they discovered 
that when it came down to like whether to make the payment or not, it didn't rely on the evidence base as much as it relied on kind of political will in those moments. So like, again, political power and so forth. So if there was a lot of pressure to just pay, this, pay them, then they did. Um, and the actual percentage of people who used more rigorous methods that said, okay, we're gonna set it up a, a priori, and the part of it's because they didn't set it up a priori as to be evaluated with very strong quasi-experimental or experimental designs. And so that's what they discovered, and so it was kind of on some sense that they were a little disappointed as they were walking through all these programs that had these elements that there wasn't a strong evaluation framework and again, there's some that were, some that weren't, but I mean, as a whole, there were many more that were not as strong as they had hoped. Um, but they, the trend is in the direction toward when they do this to have better designs. So that's kind of the context that I, I learned there, but there's, there is definitely more details in the book on, on how they walk that through. I, I think you, you raised an interesting point earlier around being able to reach more people in the UK this way, and so some of the limitations around evaluation because of that. And Petersburg project, the first project, they actually ended that project early because the intervention had been replicated to such an extent that they weren't able to really compare that group anymore. So you have to think about the trade-off there. I mean, when we talk about the promise of pay for success in social impact funds, ideally at the start, we were talking about systems change, right? And so this idea of aligning different stakeholders around shared values is kind of the penultimate goal here. And so if you think about, like, what does it take to make billions of dollars it might be some sacrifice in terms of the strength and rigor of evaluation versus in the, the US, you see five years happening to get one project that's serving 300 individuals and there's definitely evidence to show that this is going to work, but at the end of the day, you've spent millions of dollars to reach 300 individuals and haven't necessarily created a program that can be scaled to all of California, let's say. So I think you kind of have to, in all of this, there's complexity that you have to think about the trade-offs. Some of the criticism that we've seen in the US has been that this has not evolved to be an asset class or something that can be replicated or done more efficiently. Um, and some of that, not all, but certainly, has to do with the evaluation piece. Certainly some of it, and I think you guys started to talk about this before, has to do with the fact that we haven't oriented ourselves in this way before. You know? And so when we think about a systems change innovation, it's right to assume that it would take a number of years to think about sharing data, not only across agencies within a, a government, within LA County, for instance, but across stakeholders. So between service providers and governments and investors and evaluators. We've never done that before. We don't operate that way traditionally. And so a lot of these projects you can think of as having sort of one-time startup costs and time associated with them that you know, could potentially lead to greater efficiency but it's a very different way of approaching a systems change innovation. All right, well thank you all for joining us. Thank you.